This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. A cyber attack takes down a major Ukrainian internet provider. Ghostwriter is said to deploy Cobalt Strike against the Ukrainian government. Anonymous makes some large claims. This just in. Spies drive drunk. Ukrainian intelligence doxes FSB officers. Conventional criminals continue to exploit sympathy for Ukraine in social engineering scams. Red Lily automates software supply chain attacks. Ben Yellen considers Russian cyber capabilities. Mr. Security Answer Person John Pescatori addresses security automation. And CISA offers mitigation guidance on risks to uninterruptible power supplies. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, March 29th, 2022. Reuters reports that Euchre Telecom, Ukraine's major telecom provider of both internet connectivity and mobile service, sustained a major cyber attack yesterday. It was apparently a distributed denial-of-service attack that Euchre Telecom described as temporary difficulties with the installation of new internet sessions for Euchre Telecom customers. NetBlocks confirmed that Euchre Telecom service had indeed been disrupted with real-time network data showing connectivity collapsing to 13% of pre-war levels. Forbes quotes senior Ukrainian officials as saying they're presently unsure whether the attack was a conventional distributed denial-of-service attack or represented a deeper intrusion into Euchre Telecom's systems. The State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine was quick to attribute the incident to a Russian cyber attack which it said Ukraine had been able to mitigate. Euchre Telecom gave priority to military users and is said to be on the way to restoring full service for private and commercial customers. This seems to be the most significant Russian cyber attack since the opening hours of the invasion, but it still falls short of the disruptive attacks against Ukrainian infrastructure that have been widely expected. Ghostwriter, a threat actor associated with the Belarusian government, has been using spear phishing attacks to install Cobalt Strike Beacon in Ukrainian government systems. Security Affairs cites CERT-UA as the source of the report. Cobalt Strike is a common legitimate penetration testing toolset that's been turned to illegitimate use by criminals and, as in this case, intelligence services. The Wall Street Journal has an account of a Ukrainian researcher's infiltration of chatter by the managers of the TrickBot banking trojan. The group interpenetrates Conti's operators, and the chats disclosed show a similar commitment to Russia's war effort. They also indicate an interest in hitting Western targets, including U.S. hospitals. But these should be taken with an appropriate grain of salt. Not only are the leaks so far unconfirmed by official sources— but criminals and privateers, like hacktivists, tend to crow large. A similar tendency is probably in evidence on the Ukrainian side, where hacktivists who claim allegiance to Anonymous say on Twitter they're working on a data dump from their compromise of construction firm Rostprojekt. Twitter has suspended some accounts associated with Anonymous, but Security Affairs reports that the hacktivist collective is saying that it's already counted coup against both the all-Russia state television and radio broadcasting company and the Russian central bank. 
Ukrainian intelligence services have released the names and addresses of 620 people they allege to be FSB officers. The Times reports that, as well as names and addresses, the list includes details of agents' cars, such as their number plates, their phone numbers, and dates and places of birth. According to the Telegraph, some of the officers whose data were exposed are believed to be operating in foreign countries, including the UK. The data in the leaked files includes what appear to be entries in personnel files, and some of it, in truth, is kind of cringy, like observations that one officer likes luxury cars maybe a bit too much, and that another drinks too much and has a propensity to violate traffic laws. So what's next? Sudden unexplained wealth? The incident is an embarrassing black eye for the FSB, which has attracted President Putin's ire for what he retrospectively sees as misleadingly optimistic intelligence assessments of Ukrainian public opinion and will to resist a Russian invasion. Criminals are taking advantage of widespread sympathy for Ukraine's experience under Russian aggression by preying upon people's desire to help out. Grid News says the scams include conventional donation scams and more exotic appeals to those who would join the hacktivist IT army that's formed under the uncertain direction of Kyiv to fight Russian interests. There are reports that naive volunteer hacktivists have been induced to install malware in their devices after being convinced that, no, really, they're helping set up distributed denial-of-service attacks against Russian networks. Fortinet and Intizer independently report criminal campaigns to deliver Iced ID, a Trojan that's been observed in the wild since 2017. Fortinet describes spear phishing emails with attached and bogus invoices that carry Iced ID as their malicious payload. Intizer reports that Iced ID distributors have also turned to conversation hijacking as the means to deploy the Trojan. Proofpoint researchers report that employment fraud continues to appear at a high level and that it disproportionately affects students at colleges and universities. They say there are many variations of this threat, including job offers as caregivers, mystery shoppers, administrative assistants, models, or rebate processors. The goal of employment fraud isn't usually direct theft from victims, but rather either theft of identities or credentials or the recruitment of victims into criminal activity, as, for example, money mules. Checkmarks has been tracking the activities of the Red Lily threat actor, which has been engaged in using anonymous disposable NPM accounts as one-time distribution vectors for malicious packets. Red Lily has developed the ability to mount these software supply chain attacks at scale. According to Checkmarks, The attacker has fully automated the process of NPM account creation and has opened dedicated accounts, one per package, making the new malicious packages batch harder to spot. As Checkmarks notes, they're not the only researchers to have observed the activity. Both JFrog and Sonatype have reported on the malicious NPM activity. Red Lily's allegiances and purposes remain obscure, but the actor represents a clear threat to software supply chains. And finally, CISA this morning issued guidance on protecting uninterruptible power supplies, UPS devices, not to be confused with the United Parcel Service. CISA explains that UPS devices provide clean and emergency power in a variety of applications when normal input power sources are lost. The agency recommends that some well-founded best practice mitigations be applied at once, They say, immediately enumerate all UPSs and similar systems and ensure they are not accessible from the Internet. They say you should check your UPS's username and password and see if it's still set to the factory default. If it is, shame on you, but that's okay. Update it immediately. And they also say to ensure that credentials for all UPSs and similar systems adhere to strong password length requirements and adopt login, timeout, and lockout features. Sound advice, courtesy of CISA. And now, a word from our sponsor, Looking Glass Cyber, a global leader in cybersecurity. There's never been a more serious time for U.S. critical infrastructure sectors to shore up their cybersecurity defenses than right now. 
while ensuring internal cybersecurity solutions are blocking and detecting nefarious activities is critical, security leaders also need to understand their external attack surface. This outside-in view highlights the vulnerabilities and exposures that threat actors can see on your network. Gain a deeper understanding of vulnerabilities and exposures currently seen across the financial sector, along with a crosswalk of these items to Russian threat actors. Access your complimentary copy of the Financial Sector Cyber Profile at lookingglasscyber.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Looking Glass Cyber for sponsoring our show. Security answer person. Mr. Security answer person. Hello and welcome back to Mr. Security Answer Person. I'm John Pescatori. Let's get into our question for this week. Our question today comes from one of our listeners, Mr. Lucio Chagas. How do you see the progress of automation in the great realm of the security landscape? I would appreciate it a lot if you could link this to a little bit of history in the past versus future exercise. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chagas. This will be a fun one to answer. First, let me make an absolute statement. You cannot automate what you don't already know how to do. Doing the wrong things faster is rarely a winning strategy. This flows directly from the definition of security automation that I like to use, which comes from Red Hat. Security automation is the use of technology that performs tasks with reduced human assistance in order to integrate security processes, applications, and infrastructure. I like this definition because it points out several important things. Security automation can reduce but not eliminate the amount of human effort required or the security skills required to perform certain tasks. Often, integration between security processes is what's called automation or orchestration because such integration reduces the manual effort often involved in getting critical security information from one step in a process to the next. It points out that you must first have accurate and effective security processes, applications, and controls in place before you can automate. So security automation is not and will never be a, instead of hiring a lot more security people, dump a lot of data into a software product and it will protect you kind of deal. You must have at least all the security basics in place, for example, the first two implementation groups of the Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls, before you can benefit from automation, and to get to that point, you need a skilled security staff. The second must-have before security automation can be effective is, the automation technology has to be fast enough and accurate enough, as in low to zero false positives, and the action taken has to result in minimal, or ideally no, business disruption. A lot of security automation technologies talk about zero false negatives. We did not miss a single heart bleed attack, but never mention a false positive rate. Um, 20% of the time, what we called a heart bleed attack was really a legitimate access. Similarly, stopping a threat but crashing complex business applications and transactions is rarely a net positive for the business. Some examples in the past where those two requirements have been met and security automation has proven to be valuable. Signature-based antiviral. A file matches a known malicious file signature, and we automatically delete it versus just warn the user and flag for security review. We like to trash signature-based approaches because of their high false negative rate, but their lack of false positives enables automation. Web security gateways. We block user access to known bad URLs. We don't just warn the user and hope they comply. Again, low false positives is key. Having the required fix-by-date triggered by a vulnerability rescan. Integrating trouble ticket data with automated vulnerability scans to automatically update trouble ticket priority as it ages. Low false positive, low business disruption. Network-based intrusion prevention. It's often called fancier things, but network-based intrusion prevention. This is where detection has reached zero false positive rates and mitigation can be done with no, or at most acceptable, business impact. We block or drop traffic versus just issue alerts. A lot of threat-specific automation is really this type of action with a very narrow focus, but if it blocks network attacks, it is really a network intrusion prevention capability. The idea is, if we are 100% certain something is bad, why let it through? 
These may sound like very simple use cases, but they are all very valuable in freeing up scarce skilled resources to focus on the hard problems, allowing us to use pieces of software and lesser skilled or experienced analysts to handle more routine issues. An extension of this is where the integration of data and the application of smart software, which could be but does not have to be machine learning, is used to prioritize alerts or action recommendations to reduce time to respond. Not very sexy automation, but very powerful in reducing time to detect without increasing staff. But a lot of the automation examples tossed around are detection, analysis, response, and remediation are magically all automated. An old example was where a credentialed vulnerability scan could identify unpatched servers and automatically install the patches. But there are often valid business reasons why a server had to be left unpatched and forcing patches would disrupt operations. Not to mention that in most organizations, the security group is not responsible for patching. More recent examples around detecting an attack and automatically changing firewall or IPS rules or server OS configurations. Almost none of these are practicable yet in the real world, complex business application environments we're in. False positives and mitigation rates are just too high. So, Mr. Chagas, to summarize, integration of well-thought-out security processes is a powerful form of automation that can reduce time to detect, respond, and restore. It takes skilled security folks and very accurate security tools to reach that point. In certain areas, many have done just that. This level of automation can allow lesser skilled security staff to handle more security events per shift, which enables our limited security unicorns to focus on the more difficult issues, and that is a huge gain. But hyped up security automation, as in AI detects and kills attacks fast, is a long way away from more than the simplest of attacks in the real world. I think the most likely area we will see near-term advances in more sophisticated automation will be by embedding security policies into the kernel level of virtual environments such as VMware and cloud-based applications. There's an intersection of security admin, app admin, and virtual platform admin where the AWSs, Azures, Google Cloud Platform folks do amazing stuff. If you can get those three worlds to cooperate in the virtual data center, more amazing automation is possible. Thanks for listening. I'm John Pescatori, Mr. Security Answer Person. Mr. Security Answer Person. Mr. Security Answer Person with John Pescatori airs the last Tuesday of each month right here on the CyberWire. Send in your questions for Mr. Security Answer Person to questions at thecyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, Axonius. As IT and security pros, we can all agree on two things. Complexity is increasing, and traditional asset inventory approaches no longer cut it. The only path forward? Challenging what we think we know. That means saying goodbye to the old way of doing things and saying hello to Axonius. The Axonius Cybersecurity Asset Management Platform correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up-to-date inventory, uncovers gaps, and automates action. Axonius gives IT and security teams the confidence to control complexity by mitigating threats, navigating risk, decreasing incidents, and informing business-level strategy, all while eliminating manual, repetitive tasks. Visit axonius.com slash cyberwire-complexity to learn more and try it free. That's A-X-O-N-I-U-S dot com slash cyberwire-complexity. And joining me once again is Ben Yellen. He's from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security and also my co-host on the Caveat Podcast. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Uh, interesting article caught my eye. This is uh, from Kim Zetter uh, writing over on Politico, uh, really highlighting what we have and have not seen when it comes to uh, cyber capabilities in this ongoing uh, war in uh, Russia and Ukraine. What's going on here, Ben? Yeah, so maybe I'm out of line here, but I almost found this article somewhat reassuring. Uh, Hmm. So we know that our intelligence agencies, the CIA and the NSA, have spent decades now um, spying on Russia's computer networks. They are collecting intelligence. 
both, um, you know, for the purposes of figuring out what Vladimir Putin's going to do, as they did uh, prior to this war in Ukraine. Right. But also for the potential to order destructive cyber attacks on Putin's regime. I think we've always imagined that we would use this as a defensive weapon, that if we were attacked with some type of kinetic or cyber incident, that we would want to have the capabilities to respond in kind. But what this article gets at is both sides, the United States and Russia, are treading very slowly in this potential cyber conflict. And I think the reason they are treading slowly is the same reason we didn't have widespread nuclear Armageddon during the Cold War, Mm. and that's mutually assured destruction. We don't know exactly what Russia's capabilities are, but if we went in and, uh, you know, for the purposes of responding to Russian aggression in Ukraine, damaged the critical infrastructure in Moscow. We shut off the lights, we damaged the sewer system, water treatment plants, etc., there's a very real fear that they not only would retaliate against us, which would escalate the conflict, um, and that certainly could be very difficult for our our own citizens, uh, having power cut off in a major American city Mm -hmm. or attacks on other parts of our critical infrastructure, but it could escalate from there. Uh, You know, that the cyber warfare could lead to kinetic warfare, which could eventually lead where uh, a place where none of us want to be, which is... Uh, full-on war between two nuclear powers. Right. So I just thought it was interesting and encouraging that both sides are treading lightly. Our uh, government hackers have been working for the past couple of decades to develop these capabilities. I just think there's the reluctance to use them knowing that Russia potentially has the capability to retaliate. I find it fascinating that we uh, we look at this and in retrospect, it makes absolute sense But this is not the way that people were thinking going into this conflict. What do you make of that? Right. I think people were expecting uh, that Russia would have already used offensive cyber operations in Ukraine Mm -hmm. uh, to help their war efforts. So shutting down Ukrainian power grids. A point that you made on on the Caveat podcast when we discussed this is uh, they really haven't done that really because they think it would be detrimental to their own war effort. (laughs) They've Mm -hmm. needed to use the same cellular networks Uh, that are already deployed in Ukraine for their offensive military operations. Right. Uh, So I think we haven't seen that yet as as part of this conflict. I think the conflict has been, I don't want to say traditional, but has kind of been more of a 20th century type of warfare. They, with their military, through air and, and ground support, invaded a sovereign foreign country, and we responded with uh, economic sanctions. I think that's the safest place for all of us to be right now, uh, given that this could potentially turn into a large global conflict. I think people imagine that we would, if they destroyed Ukrainian power grids or uh, nuclear facilities or something or any other attack on critical infrastructure, I think people were anticipating that we might use our cyber capabilities to do the same in Russia Uh, But I think there is a real reluctance to do that because of this fear of uh, escalation. Breaking into their country's core systems is something we, frankly, have been able to do. Uh, It's kind of a power that we we can't use lightly. Right. Um, Because if our calculus is, is wrong and we use this as an offensive weapon... As we say in the 2000s, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Yeah. To what degree is this uh, situation establishing norms in cyber conflict? Because this is all new, right? A hybrid war like this is still relatively new. So to what degree, if any, is this establishing future rules of the road? I think it's it's really unclear. It's a unique situation when we're dealing with Russia as opposed to some of our other adversaries, whether they are nation states or terrorist groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, For one, they've lost a lot of their economic power as a result of this war, but they're still a nuclear-armed country. Mm -hmm. Um, And we also have reason to believe that they have enhanced uh, cyber capabilities. We've seen them perpetuate cyber attacks before. Um, certainly their involvement in the 2016 election, GRU, mm. uh, indicates that those capabilities are there. So we know that they could respond in kind. I'm not sure that that would be the case 
in other cyber conflicts across the world. So I don't think this is setting any broad ground rules for cyber warfare. Right. Um, I think the fact that it is Russia is significant for the reasons that I mentioned. So I, I think it might not be precedent setting, uh, but I think it's just an interesting outgrowth of the conflict that we're seeing now. Yeah. All right. Well, that article is over on Politico. It's written by Kim Zetter. It's titled, Not the Time to Go Poking Around, How Former U.S. Hackers View Dealing with Russia. Ben Yellen, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, PlexTrack. PlexTrack, the proactive cybersecurity management platform, boosting teams' efficiency and effectiveness. Learn more at plextrack.com slash the cyberwire. And that's the cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, Invicti. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security, thanks to Invicti. Invicti is the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API, even if you have thousands. With unparalleled accuracy and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. And with more than 50 integrations, Invicti slides into your workflows more smoothly than any other platform. Now you can innovate as fast as you want without compromising on security. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit i.invicti.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Invicti for sponsoring our show.